hey, can we just be straightforward and honest about Joseph Smith, you know? Can, can we just go... Can we just go from a perspective of actually what the historical record shows rather than what we've been told in church, primary, by the missionaries, Sunday school? Can we just do that? And if you start wanting to scream, hey, this is all a bunch of lies, keep in mind, I do a lot of videos like these, and I document things. And so you can be directed into the Dodger Game channel or the Mormon Truth Videos channel and look up specific videos where you will see documentation and a lot of stuff here. So I'm just going to go through the narrative here because, see, when you heard bees were humming, sweet birds singing, music ringing throughout the grove, through the grove, on Joseph Smith, Smith's, oh man, where, where, what's happening here? On Joseph Smith's first uttered prayer, God comes down from the center of the galaxy near the star cluster that involves Kolob just to introduce Jesus during his lunch break, maybe. I know that's pretty much what you heard, but that's not, the, that's not what the records tell us. They tell us of a young man who was a seer. A seer who used a seer stone. See this brown guy down here? Yeah, well Joseph Smith put that in his hat. See him looking in his hat there? Where did he get this and why was he doing that? What a weird thing to do, you think. Well, actually, I'm sure everybody's heard of crystal balls. Well, seer stones are, well, they're, they're a little more portable, a little smaller, and, uh, you know, crystal's hard to find sometimes. So you stick them in your hat and you bury your face in the hat to block out the light and they glow if they've been properly consecrated and dedicated with the right magical spells. And yes, I've read the magical spells that are used. You're saying, what are you talking about, man? Okay, so this was pretty common in uh, the area where Joseph Smith lived when he was growing up. When he was about 13, a girl down the road had a seer stone and she was doing cool stuff with it, you know, finding stuff and things. She could see visions in it and see things where, you know, practical stuff like where somebody's lost chicken was maybe. And Joseph Smith wanted to do that and he borrowed her stone and he saw visions of where he could find a really cool stone too. But maybe unexpectedly he was with his dad and one of his brothers they were digging a well for a guy named Willard Chase I believe was his name a little farm down the way <clears throat> Smith's hired out because they weren't very successful with their business ventures usually so they they hired out and and somebody found this this brown rock this one right here and Joseph said hey let me put that in my hat and he did looks in his hat <coughs> Looks like that. And he said, wow, I can see cool stuff. Can I borrow it? Mr. Chase let him borrow it. Now, later, Mr. Chase was kind of into this stuff, too. If this was, you know, Joseph was the only guy doing this in the neighborhood. He wasn't the only seer or scryer or crystal gazer in the neighborhood. And Willard Chase wanted his seer stone back, but Joseph wouldn't ever give it back. He said, you shall not have it. Well, anyway... That's not very nice, is it? So Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith found lost items for people with his seer stone activities. Some people thought he, he had stolen the chickens and so forth and, uh, and you know, found them through the, this, this thing. So there, there, there are various beliefs as to whether or not he was a good magician or not. But Josiah Stoll thought he was a pretty good magician. And Joseph Smith had been leading treasure-seeking parties that his dad was involved with, usually at night, looking for, like, Captain Kidd's treasures and all kinds of stuff, you know, in the, in the area. And, yes, this is documented. And uh, he got a reputation. You know, some people say that, that they actually hit, you know, treasure chests when digging. But uh, they'd sink deeper into the earth. They had to uh, cast magical spells. They, they used a magic knife and drew magic circles. 
and actually sacrificed some poor animals, usually black animals, black uh, goats, sheep, and if you couldn't get one, a dog maybe. Those are the kinds of things that I've read. And sprinkled their blood around the edge of the circle because they were appeasing demon guardian spirits guarding the treasure. You know, like maybe a, a pirate who was buried next to the treasure or something. One of the, one of the you know, <clears throat> guys that helped dig the hole, they'd kill him and leave him there. Um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that they were actually into. So Josiah Stoll lived 150 miles away, and I think his son lived uh, around Palmyra, and he, he visited Joseph Smith and uh, asked him if he'd come be his seer because they had a, a treasure-seeking project looking for a mine, I think, on his property. He had a pretty large amount of property, and he'd fired his previous seer because he was not having any success with him. So Joseph and his dad uh, got involved with this, and, and they went there 150 miles away. They needed a place to stay. They stayed at at uh, the Hales' home, the Hales, where Emma Hale lived. So Emma Hale turned into the farmer's daughter story. She wound up eloping with Joseph Smith eventually, not immediately. And during this period of time, Joseph Smith claimed that uh, he'd been informed, either be it by his seer stone or uh, a messenger, that there were these gold plates deposited that contained, you know, what we call the Book of Mormon, the record of the uh, American Indians and that they had been Israelites. So uh, he was going to go get this uh, after he had this visitation, supposedly. And he went and dug with some, some friends, some people that were also in the uh, digging and scrying business there but they, they didn't come across it. Later, they heard rumors that he had found it, or was and, 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 and so when he was going to go get it, well, of course he couldn't get it the first time, the second time, you know, he was told by the messenger he had to bring Alvin, but then Alvin died before the uh, equinox when he was to go get it. You know, that's a heavy duty time for magical things going on, and September 22nd or so was uh, the fall equinox. So Joseph was supposed to bring Alvin and then Alvin died. Well eventually the spirit told him to bring Emma, apparently dressed in black with a black horse and all that sort of thing at midnight in the equinox. All sort of magical witchcraft kind of stuff and uh, that's when they say he got the plates. Never mind that the description of them would have made them weigh about 200 pounds. Joseph Smith was a uh, pretty strong guy but nobody can run with 200 pound plates and knock out like three guys along the way who are trying to get them from him assailants that wanted a piece of the action of these gold plates but we have some interesting stories in church history and so Joseph Smith was a seer using a seer stone but in the Book of Mormon when he published it eventually after having been convicted in 1826, it appears, or at least charged and admitting in court that he had necromantic powers. Josiah Stoll defended him against his his nephew, I believe, who thought Joseph was basically, you know, ripping off Josiah Stoll. Josiah Stoll said he's a good strier, he's a good treasure seeker, he does a good job. We just uh, couldn't overcome the magical spells and things slipped away into the ground and that kind of thing. So Joseph admitted to that around 18, 1826. Yeah, he's still involved in magic and things, you know, sound like witchcraft at that time. And uh, he publishes the Book of Mormon in uh, March of 1830. Next month, April, starts the church. He established a church called the Church of Christ. There were six people involved in starting the church. And this Book of Mormon had written in it these magical glasses right here, which are supposed to be the way he was going to translate it, since uh, in Ether chapter 3 it says they were prepared and called interpreters. They're not called Urimanthamum, they were called interpreters. They were magical implements used for interpreting 
ancient languages. Which is why Mosiah possessed them because he got them from what, the people of Limhi or something who had the 24 place belonging to the Jaredites who had killed all of each other in North America in a gigantic civil war. But had left these special magic glasses called interpreters and whoever used them is called a seer. Just like Joseph Smith was already called a seer. Isn't that coincidental? But Martin Harris, you know, was helping Joseph out. And uh, you like this cool Leahona? Okay. Yeah, that's an artist's rendition. They made it. So um, this stone actually Joseph used, okay? These glasses, somebody made that stuff up to, you know, try to... Because they said that he got these out of the stone box, you know? and the Sword of Laban and stuff, but actually nobody can ever find that stuff. Anything that came out of the Book of Mormon seems to have gone back into it, into the treasure cave or something in the Hill Cumora that Brigham Young and Oliver Cowdery talk about. Oh, you didn't hear that one in primary? I didn't teach it in Sunday school either. Never heard of it until I got into reading the actual primary source documents. So anyway, Joseph Smith publishes the Book of Mormon and they got these magic glasses in them, but they also have a stone that shines just like his. And it's in Alma. You can find it there. And it reveals the secret works of their brethren, like, you know, Gideon and robbers of the Lamanites or whoever, you know. Um, so, uh, we were supposed to believe he was using these magic glasses, but Joseph didn't have much money. And, uh, he talked Martin Harris into helping him out. And so Martin Harris was, he mortgaged his farm to print the Book of Mormon. Um, maybe they had some arrangement there. He was going to get paid back, but the Book of Mormon didn't sell for as much money as they wanted to or something. Um, Martin lost uh, most of his acreage. Well, anyway, during this process, Martin's wife was like, uh, so, Martin, you get involved with a lot of weird stuff and churches and religions and stuff, and you want to mortgage our farm for this dude, and you're doing all this, uh, you know, uh, writing for him. You're his scribe. Instead of taking care of the farm, you're risking everything we've got. I'm a little concerned. Can you show me something from this guy? Show me something to help me believe this, because, you know, you're not... You don't have a lot of credibility. So, um, you know, he asked Joseph Smith, can I, can I take the manuscript, this 116 pages, and show my wife? And Joseph said, oh, let me ask the Lord. And we all heard that story. Praise God says no. He praise God says no. Mark says, please, ask again. See if God will change his mind. So Joseph says he... You know, gets a, another answer from God. So, Martin takes him, and he never brings him back. So, some people think that Martin Harris has stole the hundred and... Martin Harris's wife stole him and burned him or something. The 116 pages. Other people thought, who knows what. But anyway, Joseph Smith gets really worried after this. And what was the worry? Well, he said, somebody, if I... If we redo it, and somebody's going to... If they've got him, they'll just change... What, what's on him, and then they'll say I'm a fake and a phony. And so he said, I lost my gift. So for about a month, he says, he didn't know how to translate anymore. Because, you know, Martin Harris' his wife said something like, well, you know, if you lost him, just go ahead and redo him again. At least I think she challenged him to do that. At least that's the idea. See if he could replicate the same, the same words. Apparently, he was pretty worried about this. So he says, no, that's the devil... The devil's idea, after about a month he says this, he didn't know what to say before that, so he just said he lost his gift. And then he says, well, it's the devil's plan, uh, because they'll change the words on it. And so he says, oh, but I've got these other plates that we can translate, and they cover the same time period, ironically, but they're just different, so they don't have to match. Oh, okay, how nice. You know... Uh, have you ever actually thought about that? Let's keep in mind that they wrote in ink. They didn't have anything that could erase ink. But if they had some magic potion to erase some of the ink, 
then they would have to forge exactly Martin's handwriting and Emma's from before that and fit some different words into the same space and match the handwriting of the you know people that had actually written in there yeah well obviously it's impossible so Joseph Smith's story doesn't make any sense at all but that's what happened and so supposedly Moroni took the plates back for a while but he brought them back later uh, according to the story, but he didn't give Joseph his magic glasses, but he said that's okay. I'll just use my magic rock I'm already so good at finding things with it Even though we never recovered anything except for maybe some lost chickens in the neighborhood So I'll just use that and that way I can translate these plates Of course the plates were never in the room according to his wife Emma or David Whitmer when he was using the rock in his hat yeah no plates necessary. No well, people found this to be a little bit odd. Anyway, Joseph Fielding Smith uh, denied that this happened, even though Joseph F. Smith uh, quoted David Whitmer and, you know, had no problem saying that upon this rock, they would see when it glowed in the dark in his hat, a piece of parchment, you know, like old fashioned paper. And on it would be like one Egyptian hieroglyph, since supposedly uh, these Israelites used Egyptian. And, uh, and they'd see English. And they'd see the words. And, and they wouldn't disappear until uh, Martin Harris or Oliver Cowdery, had, you know, I think it was Cowdery by then, had um, actually copied everything correctly. So there would be no mistakes. Of course, that was about 4,000 mistakes ago after Jesus had said that the thing was done correctly by the gift and power of God in section one of the Doctrine and Covenants. So figure that one out. Um, yeah, that's the way it was. And so, we, you know, Joseph Smith started telling people about these plates, which basically said, made, made it look like he was a, a prophet here. And, and he had answers as to how the American Indians uh, got, you know, to the Americas. And, uh, you know, didn't have to explain them as, like, coming across the Bering Strait, you know, before Adam would have been alive, which would destroy the whole Bible thing, which, you know, wasn't a good thing. So he explained it. They're Israelites, and they, they just uh, got real disobedient, so God turned them extra brown like this uh, seer stone and uh, made them look different from what he thought Jews should look like. So, um... Got it all explained there. Anyway, we won't talk too much about the anachronisms in the Book of Mormon right now, I don't think. You know, that they were speaking Greek 2200 B.C. before Greek existed or anything like that. We're just focusing on the history. Well, about a couple of years later, uh, Joseph Smith apparently wrote something in his uh, journal saying that he had had this vision that Jesus appeared to him at some point. And that he had gone to try to get a, a remission of his sins and that sort of stuff uh, when he was like 16 or something. And, uh, you know, he, that he knew that all the churches were untrue and stuff. But uh, anyway, it's not exactly like the first vision story we now have. Fact is that nobody ever heard of a first vision for many years. Uh, Joseph Smith wasn't preaching that at all, oddly enough even though his history now says he told Methodist ministers and everybody persecuted him, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, actually, his own family said that he, they started going to these revivals in 1823. Um, yeah, and Alvin died in 1823, like November, so the, the, if they were going to these things, it would have been a couple months before that, probably, when the weather was a little warmer. And after Alvin died, they started seeking, seeking, you know, some kind of spiritual... Uh, you know, comfort, and then they went to some of these churches. Churches where they would have been actually persecuting them had Joseph Smith's story been accurate. But uh, instead they went to them looking for some sort of solace. And uh, a funeral was done by a Presbyterian minister who evidently offended Joseph Smith Sr. by, by basically hinting that Alvin had gone to hell because he hadn't been baptized. So he wouldn't go to any of these meetings later when they went to them. And... Uh, According to William, Joseph's brother, yeah, they didn't start any of this till 1823, and that's when the revival started happening there. So none of this 1820 stuff uh, seems to work. 
uh, neither Joseph Smith's family joining the Presbyterian Church at that time either because they did that in 1823 or 4. So long after the time period Joseph Smith's talking about in his what was then a brand new story they did he didn't publish until two years before he died about in 1842 this story we had where uh, birds were singing and bees, bees were humming and all that stuff throughout the grove when God comes to see him on his first prayer so it's nothing like we've been told his family never heard of such a vision none of their testimonies about their history and any of that ever indicate him ever having such a vision they knew about the uh, the Book of Mormon stuff, but uh, you know, and some messenger come in and have him using the seer stone, and then you know the guy's name was apparently Nephi, but uh, got changed to Moroni after Joseph Smith was dead by Orson Pratt. Although actually, to be fair, he did say Moroni in a couple of times between 1835 and 1838, but I've seen like five publications, including the Pearl of Great Price, um, that Joseph Smith was responsible for. Um, well, one in England he wasn't really responsible for. They were basically copying what he said, but uh, it was always Nephi. Sorry, people. Except for those two other instances. So, uh, yeah. Weird story. So here's the Leohona. That's a magical thing that we found in the Book of Mormon. We've got the magic glasses found in the Book of Mormon. We've got another magic seer stone in the Book of Mormon in Alma. And... Uh, yeah, all that stuff, Sword of Laban and all that junk. Uh, supposedly uh, Brigham saw it in the treasure cave there in Camorra, the secret cave. They had, you know, golden stuff, golden records piled to the ceiling. Got plenty of testimony on that. They don't teach it in church, but uh, you can read it. Book, you know, uh, Brigham Young, Oliver Cowdery, these guys talked about it. Yeah, pretty... Uh, pretty interesting and uh, nothing like what we've been told. See these things here? This is called Jupiter Talisman. They're magical charms and uh, Joseph Smith uh, kept these with him on his person as they say. These were his magic charms. He, was, uh, he had them in his possession when he was shot. They are astrological and have magic spells and whatever, you know, has to do with having power over women and all this kind of stuff that Joseph Smith was pretty good at. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's some magic stuff. Probably didn't know about that. They're called the Jupiter. It's called the Jupiter Talisman. Maybe you've heard of the uh, Holiness to the Lord parchment. This is a magical parchment here. Hiram kept this on him. I think he had it on him when he was killed, too. Holiness to the Lord. Yeah, you see that in front of the temple? It's, uh, th those are magic words, holiness to the Lord, in case you didn't know that. Magical terminology. Many things in the church are magical terminology. You know, things that's consecrating, dedicating, whether it's temples or homes or graves or, you know, all that kind of stuff. That comes from magic. It was said that Joseph Smith had certain keys by which he could understand or detect things in the unseen world. And that's why Josiah Stoll went to him. Keys. We have degrees in Freemasonry and in the Celestial Kingdom. Lots of Masonic language having to do with the establishment of the Relief Society. Here's Joe's. Why, an actual photograph! No, it's a painting. Whose hat is that? Is that what you feel fa fancy? Magic glasses, somebody's strange ideas. Mm hmm. So we create these things and then we bring them into reality. We bring stuff out of storybooks, like magic glasses and stuff, into reality. But he already had the magic stone before he got into the whole Book of Mormon thing because he was trying to practice magic. It's just a list of all these women that were supposedly hanging out with him as concubines, or the church calls them wives now, mothers and daughters and sisters and who knows what. Anyway, other dudes' wives, like 11 of them, yeah, sealed to him for eternity so that they can't have their own families forever anymore. But we're supposed to think that God commanded him to break his covenants with Emma to cleave unto her and none else. They avoid those arguments. They've got special ways of 
avoiding the most important part of these uh, concerns that they've got on LDS.org on the Gospel Topics essays. They lead us away from the most damning evidence that Jesus lied over and over in the LDS scriptures and that Joseph Smith was a very dishonest person. There's Dan Vogel, pretty good historian. He's got some good videos and some good books. I've used some 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 of that some of his videos for source material. So Mormon and Moroni, why did you lug those plates around when Joseph could just look in his hat? There's a magic divining rods. Joseph's dad was into that, so was Oliver Cowdery. They lived and did magic. Disney's convinced us that there's no such thing. It's just to make believe, but uh, there are plenty of people that are into magic and witchcraft and Freemasonry, and they all kind of run together. Well, at least at the higher levels. See you, Joseph. We're going to have to uh, wind up this episode and... Uh, move along with something uh, in our next episode, Sword of Laban. Is that really a golden hilt? Yeah, Joseph Smith could see that in the middle of the night. You could tell it was gold and that we had a, a blade of fine steel. Even though steel hadn't been invented yet. Amazing, isn't it? It's been a Mormon Truth video. Hope you like, subscribe, and comment. Keep it clean. Thanks. Bye.